Shalom from Israel. I'm Shira Sokoram, and I want to welcome you to Israel Frontline, your guide to Israel and the Middle East. We want to give you information you will probably not hear in the mainstream media regarding life in Israel and the Israeli-Arab conflict. And we'll add a biblical perspective to our reality. Today, we will continue examining whether or not the state of Israel has a legal right to exist. As you know, the Muslim world publicly denies this right. In this third program of a series of four, we will analyze the reactions of Jews and Muslims to the United Nations resolution to grant Israel full state membership into the UN. On the program today, the UN partitions Palestine. The UN welcomes Israel as a member state. Israel's many wars. Finally, our panel guests will share their perspectives on the Arab response in the UN and the events which followed the creation of the State of Israel. The League of Nations was the forerunner of the United Nations. Both of these world bodies upheld the Balfour Declaration, which declared that Great Britain looked with favor upon the establishment in Palestine a national home for the Jewish people. But after decades of violence and vicious rioting by the Arabs, who refused to accept Jews living in the Middle East, the UN tried to figure out some formula that would give the Jewish people a homeland, but also placate the Arab nations. So the UN divided what was left of the British mandate into three separate little sections for Israel, and the rest for the Arabs. Look at the sections of purple on the map. Israel was given a part of Galilee in the north and a strip along the coast of the Mediterranean. The third and largest area was desert in the south. These three disconnected sections for Israel were militarily unsustainable. The green area in Galilee and the center of the country represents what was to be given to the Arabs, along with the Gaza Strip and an area along the border with Egypt. Remember that Britain had already given 76% of the Holy Land to the Arabs by creating the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. Now the UN was again prepared to divide what was left in order to create a second Arab state alongside a Jewish state. The ancient land of Judah, the heart of the area God had specifically given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you can read it in the book of Genesis, was now being handed over to the people of Allah. As we will soon see, even though what the UN gave to Israel was militarily unsustainable in a sea of Islamic enemies, Israel said yes to the UN and the Arabs said no. When the UN Resolution 181 was brought to an affirmative vote, Israel said yes. Israel agreed to receive this tiny piece of land for her new state. More than mystifying is the fact that after six million Jews had been murdered in that very decade, Britain could not bring herself to cast her UN vote in favor of Israel. She was the only European state that abstained. Even Russia voted for Israel, but every single Muslim nation in the UN voted against Israel's statehood. It was destiny that at that time the Muslim countries and their close allies did not yet have the majority vote in the UN General Assembly as they do today. Israel accepted UN Resolution 181 and founding father David Ben-Gurion declared Israel a free and independent state on May 14, 1948. The Arabs completely rejected the UN Resolution 181 and the very next day after Israel declared her independence, 
five Arab nations invaded Israel, vowing to destroy the nascent state. When the smoke cleared, the Jordanians had occupied Judea and Samaria, known as the West Bank, and East Jerusalem for themselves. The Egyptians appropriated Gaza for themselves. They were able to do this because there was no Palestinian people or Palestinian state in existence. Up until then, the only rulers over Palestine for the last 500 years had been the Ottoman Turks and the British. 4,000 Jews lost their lives in that war of independence, but Israel actually gained about 60% of what the UN had offered the Arabs for their state. The CIA did not believe Israel could possibly win. Israel only had some 20 thousand to thirty thousand irregular troops for most of the war. Many of them were new immigrants and couldn't even understand their commanders who spoke Hebrew, while the Arabs had large regular armies. It was an absolute miracle. Nineteen years later, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan again threatened to throw Israel into the sea and in an act of war, blockaded Israel's entrance to the Red Sea. In 1967, they expelled the UN troops from the Sinai Peninsula, telling them they were going to invade Israel. Five other Arab nations delivered aircraft, and even Pakistani pilots took part in this war. But in a six-day war, Israel struck back in a lightning preemptive strike chasing the Egyptians out of Gaza, the Jordanians out of Judea and Samaria, that's the West Bank, and ancient Jerusalem. Israel conquered the Sinai Desert and captured the Golan Heights from Syria, ending the decades-long constant terrorist attacks from those heights down on Jewish villages and communities in Galilee. In six days, one of the most remarkable victories in the history of warfare. The Arab nations had no choice but to sign ceasefire agreements with Israel. But they emphasized, as they did back in 1949, that they were not recognizing any borders of any kind with Israel since they did not accept the existence of a Jewish state. No Israel, no Jews, no borders. Six years later, Arab nations invaded Israel again with a surprise attack on Israel's holiest day, Yom Kippur. Again, miraculously, though in dire straits, Israel pushed the Arabs back and actually could have marched into Cairo in the south and Damascus in the north. But by this time, the UN powers that be were almost hysterical and demanded that Israel immediately halt. Another ceasefire was arranged, but again, no borders were designated because, remember, the Arabs refused to recognize the Jewish state and therefore would not negotiate a peace agreement. Until today, no borders for Israel have been assigned in written form by anyone, only ceasefire lines. It is so absolutely ironic that Palestinian leaders are demanding that Israel return to the pre-six-day war borders when they know very well there is no such thing. The nations of the world play along with the charade, demanding Israel return to the 1967 borders, but not demanding that the Palestinians recognize Israel's right to exist as a Jewish nation. The Arabs and the newly created Palestinian people have never given up the intention of destroying Israel. In the Second Intifada, which began in the year 2000 in the West Bank, there was every kind of terror you could possibly imagine. Suicide bombers at restaurants, late night commando raids, bus bombings, bar mitzvah shootings, random stabbings, street riots, town sieges, bicycle bombers, clashes at holy sites, car bombs, sniper firefights, human shields, mortar attacks on towns and farms. 
experts had warned Israel that it is impossible to win against guerrilla warfare, which is what the Intifada was. However, Israel had no choice if she were to survive. After 5,800 Arab militants were killed, the Intifada was over. Yes, 1,053 Israeli men, women, and children were murdered, and 2,267 Israelis injured. 120 Arab suicide bombers made themselves martyrs. But what did the Arabs in Judea and Samaria gain? For a start, the loss of their fast-growing economy and the hardships of many new Israeli checkpoints and a protective fence, partially a wall, which, by the way, the world said was illegal, but which kept the suicide bombers out of Israel proper. Sadly, 110,000 Arabs from the West Bank lost their jobs in Israel because of the many acts of terror committed by some of these employees. Because the educational system in the West Bank, like in Gaza, is so full of hatred and revenge, and because of the Islamic ideology that promises a glorious paradise in the afterlife for Islamic martyrs, the youth of the Palestinian Authority are groomed to commit terrorist acts. This is why the West Bank will most likely continue to experience waves of terror against the Jewish people. It is important to add here that Israel is not a nation of citizens with wings. Israel has bigoted inhabitants who are striking out against the Arabs in what we call price tag attacks. Jews tend not to resort to murder, thank God. However, there have been extremist Jewish acts of violence, especially among the ultra-Orthodox Jews. But I can clearly say that Israel is no better or worse than any other nation. Its citizens, for the most part, do not yet follow God and His Messiah as does not the rest of the world. Therefore, I wish to bring out another issue that is critical to God and therefore must be critical to us. Israel is our example that God has given to us. The scriptures say, now these things became our examples, meaning from the Old Testament, and they were written for our admonition. Through Israel, God reveals to us how he deals with all human beings throughout the world. In the Bible, when Israel sinned against God through disobedience and coldness towards their creator, the Lord allowed war, plagues, and famine to come upon his people. When King Solomon dedicated the beautiful temple to the Lord, he prayed that in times of famine and plagues, or when Israel was defeated or harassed by her enemies, that if they would return to God, repent of their sin, and ask God to heal and protect them, he would answer their prayers. The Lord answered King Solomon and said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. That promise is as true today as it ever was. Israel will be delivered from her enemies completely when the people of Israel return to the Lord God of Israel through the revelation of His Son, Yeshua, the Messiah. This is true for every nation. Repentance and turning back to God will bring victory from our enemies. Stay tuned. We will return shortly and have a discussion with our panel of Israeli guests. One of the ways Maoz reaches out to Israelis is by supporting the Hebrew-speaking, spirit-filled congregation Tiferet Yeshua in the heart of Tel Aviv. It is a place of intimate worship, corporate prayer, and powerful teaching for believers but non-believers at the services always marvel at the love they receive from the people of God. Just as Yeshua said, through this love, 
they will know we are his disciples. Join us in reaching Tel Aviv and all of Israel. Welcome back. We will now ask our panel to share their Israeli perspective on the Israel-Arab conflict. Today in the studio with us are Mati Shoshani, Director of Operations for TVN Israel from Jerusalem. Shani Ferguson, co-founder of Yeshua Israel Ministries, also from Jerusalem. And Israel Pachter, pastor of Beit Halel Messianic Congregation from Ashdod in southern Israel. Welcome and thank you for being here. Great to be here. Well, Israel, how do Messianic Jews in Israel relate to the Arab-Israel conflict? First of all, I would say with compassion, because uh, there is suffering around us and everybody wants to have peace, for sure. Because peace is always better than, than war, than conflicts. So there is lots of compassion going on, for one side. And of course, from another side, also keeping in perspective what God is doing in the Middle East, what God is doing with Israel, how God is shaking in uh, or allowed to nations be shaken. So it's uh, both, uh, we see compassion, we see people sorry, lots of people praying for peace, praying for our brothers, Arab brothers, and just uh, a Palestinian population in Israel and in West Bank, in Gaza, and etc. So there is, there is both. But what I like to see, uh, it's a desire for peace, but also they're not uh, really compromising, but they trying to understand what God is doing, mm -hmm. and there is a bigger picture and promises of God. But at the same time, you see the suffer of daily life. So it's right. like really both, lots of compassion, lots of prayers and tears. Right. I just want to say there's, you know, for, the, for the outside viewer, I think it's hard to appreciate how far the distance is between the Jewish and the Palestinian community. I'm not talking about Israeli Arabs who live inside Israel, the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. Many people don't realize that our theology, any people, is shaped by your life circumstances. Right. So you have you know, the Israelis who are living in a predominantly, you know, victorious country. We've won all the wars, we're still here, we're successful, and the Palestinians are living on, on entirely different life circumstances. They're living in a people that doesn't have a discussion of why they failed. They're living in people who's trying to shape their identity, find their identity. So you have this very, on very many levels, this dissonance in what they believe in between the Messianic Jews, Christian But Arabs. I think also it's, it's it, the Jewish mentality of I will prosper where I am of has course. been throughout the ages. And, and I think that part of the issue, I mean, you may develop theology depending on how your life is, but you also have um, kind of like a life perspective. And the Palestinian people as a people are very much a victim, like this is horrible for us and we're just going to sit in this and say how horrible it is and tell the world how horrible it is, instead of trying to prosper where we are because Israel did not come to this prosperous land. Like when, when, when they came in masses from all over the world, it was swamps, it was mud, there were like small villages everywhere, there was all sorts of, you know, uh, uh, nomads that would come and attack the village. There was just like malaria. There was a number of things that they just decided we're going to overcome this. And now, do you think that the reason that the Jewish people have been so positive in the worst circumstances, whereas the Arabs have just suffered in their victimhood, do you think it's because of Jewish people and Arab people, or is it from the Jewish religion and the Islamic religion. Yeah, I think it's very much from uh, historically how a people decides they're going to go forward. And I think historically the Jews have had the opportunity to say, you know, forget this or our God said we're going to survive. He said we're going to come back to our land. He said we're going to prosper. So that's what we're going to believe. And, 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 and that's think, where we're going to go. I think a big part of it is leadership. When leaders stand up and said, let's be strong, let's continue, let's go forward, or they will say, let's claim somebody, let's find who is guilty, and let's cry together, make a difference. It's true, the Palestinian leadership has guided their people into saying, hey, let's tell the world we're poor puppies that constantly need help, and that's the, the motto we're gonna go with. Right. And so the people follow, and so they just kind of sit there right. and like wait for the world to come rescue them. So Mati, what do you think uh, this, this philosophy, this religion of death. It's mm -hmm. great to die. It's super to go to paradise if you're a martyr. Do, do you think that that fits in there somehow to the lack of success among 
uh, Arab civilizations or societies? That's a, that's a deep the more philosophical question. Yes, it is. Uh, Islam, just to be fair, was very successful for a time. I mean, when it, when it emerged in the seventh century, for almost 600 years, it was a hugely successful society. But it was basically by the sword, no? By the sword, but many, many, many cultures back then, also <laughs> Christianity, uh, was by the sword. Was very successful for a time. Today, the version of Islam, and it's important to say that the version of Islam that we have today, controlling the Muslim countries, is one of extremism. It's one of violence, of hatred, and there's a whole set of things that go with that. Right. Hatred to the Jews, hatred to right. the Bible, hatred to uh, women and rights and civil rights and all all the things that do with that. Where so, did that come from? I mean, do you th you're saying that in the Middle Ages, um, the Islamic religion was more moderate? Definitely, they had a, they had a discussion. I think for many, if you look, this is again we're going to a very historical discussion. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you look at what they had, they had in their society a discussion of what they believe in, and this is something you mentioned Judaism before. This is something that's existed in Judaism throughout history. I think it's one of the reasons we're still you know we're still here is because we had an ongoing discussion of what we believe in as a people, and that sort of kept things personal, kept things right. alive. Islam lost touch with that. They became dogmatic about what they believe in. And now it's become this extremist, violent uh, religion where it's religious. Where it's mm -hmm. not, it's a different question. And yet the West goes ahead and says, oh, it's a peace-loving religion. Yeah, I, I do want to note, though, that there are, I mean, because we're making these blanket statements, yeah. they, there are people who, you know, I, I, I know when we go to the States in certain um, areas, and they, they are Arabs that have immigrated from the Middle East, and they are extremely successful business people. So it's not right. for lack of intelligence, right. it's not for lack of stamina, it just yeah. seems like in these areas where these people do not have freedom and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to speak out and say what they were, or to have discussions, or uh, to develop themselves because they're told, like, this is what we are. We are these people, we are suffering, blah, blah, blah. We need to have our own state in order to, to thrive, which I think is a mm -hmm. big mistake. We need to have our own state in order to thrive is mm -hmm. the argument that they're throwing out, which isn't, it, it's right. not how it happened. The Jewish right. people were thriving where they were, even though they're, um, you know, on some level, yeah. some places where they're being annihilated, but they were thriving where they were. And then they came and mm -hmm. brought that thriving mentality into Israel. Right. So, Israel, what has been interesting to me is that the Christian population in the West Bank, especially, because there's hardly any Christians in Gaza, that it, to be in the Hamas controlled area is not a healthy thing for any Christian of any kind. But in the West Bank, Christians usually say, we're not prospering because of Israel. Now why do they do that? There is a difference between um, historic Christian churches and evangelicals, that's for sure. There is a, a difference in the percentage of people who are still angry with with Israel, but why, why do the Christians blame Israel? These, at least the uh, the the historic churches, say it's Israel's fault that everything is such a mess in the West Bank. Yep, uh, you can see this conflict from the two points of view. One, it's a general plan of God and what God is doing with the nations and He's doing today, and another one, my family circumstances. And like we've been speaking before. Uh, people on daily basis, they are suffered, and they see uh, like day by day, uh, in some points, in some check posts, Israeli soldiers, mm -hmm. so it's easy. But also they're surrounding, they're surrounded by Muslims, by, you know, a different type of violence, mm -hmm. and it's kind of easy, easy to see that way. Mm -hmm. So we really can understand them and be more merciful to them, uh, even though uh, we like to see the bigger picture and what God right. is really doing. But suffer is suffer. You know, when I see yes. soldier by my door, I see soldier by my door. So it's, this is their situation. But also Christians, uh, they get smaller in numbers. Like 40 years ago, the Christian population in West Bank was much bigger than today. So also demographic yeah. is changing. Let, let me just pick up on why? what Israel was saying. Mm -hmm. Christianity in the Middle East, regardless of Israel, has been on a decline for over 100 years. 
It's been getting worse as Muslim governments take over secular governments. Mm -hmm. The West Bank is, is the same symptom that's been happening everywhere else. Inside Israel, the same thing is happening. Smaller natural growth within the Christian society, larger within the Muslim. They leave when they can. I mean, I've, I've researched oh, this. Yeah. They, they leave when they can leave. And things have just gotten worse under the Palestinian Authority. And this is, again, you mentioned correctly, it's the mainline churches. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, in the evangelical world, or what we call the born-again world, it's, a, it's an opposite process. There are people coming to faith. Yes. And not all those people coming to faith are against Israel. Many of them are pro-Israel, I would say. They have a more balanced, a more diversified mm -hmm. opinion about the topic. Correct. Because they're not coming out of a church, they're coming out of a new expression yes. of faith. Yes. We have contact with... Um, people who are evangelizing and pastoring in the West Bank. I can tell you even there, it's not easy. They have to be very careful. They have to be very careful with who they talk to. And especially if they are evangelizing, they are in, they have to really, really watch themselves. And yet it is going on. There is, there are people coming to faith in the West Bank. You know, it's interesting. I had a friend that went in and was um, sharing the gospel with uh, several Arabs and he was Jewish and he was saying that um, they re they encountered persecution the Arabs that had received the Lord encountered persecution not because of their belief in Yeshua but because the uh, Hamas was concerned that they had become pro-Israel in their views by accepting mm -hmm. Yeshua and I think that I suspect that a lot of this um, anti-Israel thing that the church, you know, it, the Palestinian Christians have been adopting mm -hmm. has to do with the, you know, theology of necessity, with their life being surrounded by Muslims who are constantly pounding something and they're this yeah. tiny minority. Yes. So arguably mm -hmm. they've just picked up the same Islamic hate that's just around them and it's mm -hmm. not necessarily something that they've looked in scripture and said, oh wow, this is revelation, right. you know, God hates Israel. Right. Well, I think that's about all the time we have. Thank you very much, panel. Thanks for being here and uh, we'll see you next week. That's all for today's program of Israel Frontline. Thank you for watching, and we hope we were able to give you insight which will keep you informed and help you pray for Israel in a more focused way. For more articles about Israel, sign up to the free Maoz Israel Report at maozisrael.org slash sign up. Please join us next week for the conclusion of our four program series examining whether or not Israel is really legal. We will look at what the Palestinians are doing in order to get recognition as an official state without recognizing Israel as a Jewish state. On behalf of our team and myself, blessings and shalom from Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm.